Apostrophe Podcast Network. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. Go ahead and do this. Google Terry O'Reilly. If you do, invariably what will pop up first is a famous hockey player for the Boston Bruins. A Canadian, of course, because, well, all great hockey players are born in Canada. But I digress. Because I'm not talking about the six foot one, 200 pound ice bruiser and captain of the Boston team. I'm talking about another giant. A giant in the world of marketing and more specifically, advertising. Throughout my life, I have gravitated towards great storytellers, be it songwriters or radio hosts or filmmakers. I love a great storyteller. There are only a few who are utterly amazing and compelling, and Terry O'Reilly, the radio host, not the hockey player, is right up there at the top of the list. For years, he has hosted radio shows for CBC in Canada, such as O'Reilly on Advertising, Age of Persuasion, and currently his podcast, Under the Influence, which has hit over 50 million downloads. And why? Because of Terry's brilliant storytelling, all backed up by an insane amount of research. What he has to tell you about advertising will absolutely have touched a part of your own life sometime, somehow, and often profoundly. This is a five-part interview, because when Terry and I get talking, aided by just a touch of fine scotch, we are not going to stop for some time. So I've split it up into five segments, where we meander through a series of compelling subject matters. In this part four of my interview with advertising legend and Canadian radio host extraordinaire Terry O'Reilly, we talk about the loss of the commercial jingle, along with some of the great TV show theme songs, and how Terry's voice eventually became what I happen to think is one of the greatest radio voices of all time. To set the stage, we were sitting on my deck with a roaring outside fire. In case you're wondering what all that crackling is, with the sun setting on a small Ontario lake. These are the words of Terry O'Reilly. The jingle died in the 80s. When MTV appeared and when artists started licensing their songs to commercials in the 80s, that was the end of the jingle. On the two-travel To the northern wilds Past waterfalls Tumbling rapids Across the lakes in stillness Beneath the eagle's cry They wander And I think that's the message in this book is in the middle of catastrophe when you've lost your job, you've lost your credibility, you've lost your revenue, you're humiliated, fly the plane. In other words, don't stop, don't give up, don't run, fly the plane, because once you get by the turbulence or the rough part of the road, as you just said, you will find an opportunity in the middle of all that heartache that will be the next part of your career. They rode upon wood and rawhide Along the frozen highways, the creeks and forest trails, they wander. When, when did you decide you needed to start writing? It's a, that's an interesting question. When I was in high school, I would always seem to get really great marks in English class. And I didn't know why, because not unlike Pia Dorr, probably, I could, I didn't, I only saw writing assignments as homework, just like any other homework. I wasn't drawn to it. I didn't particularly covet it. It was just, but I'd get 59 in math and I'd get a, like a 91 in English and I could never quite figure it out. It was just this freakish thing that would happen every year. And I remember in, when I was leaving high school, an English teacher I had who was really one of those few wonderful teachers I had, went around the room on the last day and predicted where everybody would end up in life. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And when he got to me, he said something like, I'm paraphrasing, Terry will be 
the great writer in the country. Some crazy line like that. And I remember thinking, what? Like, what the hell is he talking about? Because literally, I had no affinity for it. But he probably, I know he sparked something in me that he saw something in me that I did not see. Well, I mean, as my friend Terry McManus would say to me, you know, if you, a creator and a creative person is a creative person. And whether they take on writing a book, writing a commercial, writing a song, either way, not necessarily the tactile ability to sketch or do a painting. I understand that. But when it comes to wordsmithing, maybe that's one of the things I like about you so much. I, though I'm very inadequate, love words. I love the use of them. My, my later years in life, I have worked often to correct myself. I'm one of the few people that if you correct my grammar, I thank you. I love having my grammar corrected. It's like, oh, Ma, I've been saying that the wrong way all the time. I just you love should be the on CBC because <laughs> the CBC Nation will correct you instantly. Yeah, but no, I shouldn't. <laughs> For a lot of other reasons, I shouldn't be on CBC. First of all, I won't use puns, so there you go. I but I think words and advertising. This is why I say about you know my my disdain for feeding pablum to the masses. I don't want them just duh, huh, huh, listening to silly stuff. I love this concept that we can gain in intelligence right up to the the time we die, right in right in well into our our older age. And so when I see a commercial that's intelligent or even brilliant, I feel edified. And think about that what that is too. That that's somebody has done that to you in thirty seconds. That's 85 words if it was wall to wall. That's less than a paragraph. That's an art. And that I, is you know, absolutely When I say art. advertising is an art and a lot of people roll their eyes at me, I'm talking about the best advertising, not the worst of advertising, mm-hmm. but the best of advertising and what has to be achieved in 30 seconds, 15 seconds, five seconds, whatever these shrinking. And if they can do that without being derivative. Speaking of being derivative, I just it just popped into my brain. That commercial that I did with uh, uh, the radio people in, at Fanshawe College, this is what, you ready for this? This is what it was. There's a place you can go to buy all of your clothes for the styles that you want. It's thrifties. Total Stairway to Heaven ripoff. <laughs> and that's what she wanted me to do. And as so I did that and then probably got a date out of it. But <laughs> so, yeah, that was not so good. Well, jing- um, you know, Jingles, uh, we had music composers on staff at Pirate, of course, because music was a big part of what we provided to advertising agencies. The jingle died in the 80s when MTV appeared and when artists started licensing their songs to commercials in the 80s. That was the end of the jingle. So our music composers literally stopped creating jingles and they were really great at jingles like Blacks' photography and all that stuff came out of our shop. But that was the end of the jingle. I didn't realize that. I'm going to pay more attention to that because the ones that I hear are just small town bad. Yeah. But I mean, the big, you know, think about the big jingles in our lives that were around forever. If you learned your ABCs, you probably learned it by reciting a jingle in your head, right? And if you wanted to know if 30 days in a month or 31 days in a month, you would, you know, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. So jingles were a powerful way to instill information in people's minds. Like it was a burr on a wool sweater. And it was a great strategy in advertising, but it lost its gloss in the 80s. People started to look down on the jingle in the 80s. It may come back then. It may. I, I have often thought the pendulum should have swung back by now because it's been a long time. It's been 40 years. But it really hasn't to in a big way yet, I don't think. Right, because ba da ba ba da is not a jingle. That's a mnemonic, I would right. consider that. Yeah. It's 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 a form of jingle, but not a full fledged you know, like uh do you eat the red ones, you know, the mm-hmm. um if you smarties, you know, right? Smarties, yep. Do you eat the red ones last, you suck them very slowly, you crunch them very, very fast. fast. Like that kind of jingle where yep. it's just memorable and everybody can sing it and it elevates a brand. Hmm. No more. And also what we lost back then was the um, the wonderful show opening music of Mike Post and all of those theme songs written for all of those sitcoms. I was interviewed on CHCH TV yesterday as part of the book launch. And I hadn't seen CHCH television in a long time, probably since I lived in Hamilton. And I sat there and watched the morning and I, I went on the guide and it was... This is their whole day programming, which is very interesting. It was like My Three Sons, Green Acres, Bonanza, Hawaii Five-O. It was all the shows of my youth, all day, mm-hmm. every day, every Monday to Friday. And then we sat, my wife and I were sitting there, and we listened to the opening song, like the Hawaii Five-O, The Ventures. 
and Green Acres, which is one of the great theme songs of all time. And I think it was the first time the stars had ever sung their own theme song, right? I think it might be the greatest in my opinion. I can still sing it. I know. But all those, they were really jingles, weren't they? Like even the Beverly Hillbilly song, which was a great one. Gilligan's Island, which always told you the theme of the show in case you forgot, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? They, you know, they, uh, the Clampets found oil on their property. Like you were told that every time or that the Gilligan's Island were going out for a, a three hour cruise or whatever. They always reiterated the theme of the show, but they were great pieces of music. Even the uh, Andy Griffith's show was on. And I think that's one of the greatest theme songs of all time with no words, which is mm-hmm. the whistle, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. By Earl Hagen, yeah. Yeah. Such a great, great piece of music. Uh, There was so much to that. I will say to you, absolutely, I was intent and calculated in the scoring of the Survivor Man theme song for my series Survivor Man. I said, I want people to be in the kitchen and hear this song come on, this theme song come on, and go, oh, Survivor Man's on, and run from the kitchen to the living room to watch it. And you know what? Uh, I accomplished that. It absolutely happened. I've seen it in post after post. People will talk about, oh man, as soon as I hear that opening, you know, that and me go, and everybody always asks me what the sound is, you know, which by the way, the whole thing was produced entirely in my basement by me. Wow. Just, just downstairs. And I did everything for it. It was just a little thing and a bass guitar. But that was my point. I wanted that, that memorable jingle, if you will, but that theme song that made you go, oh, 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 it's on, it's on. Yep. You want that. We try to achieve that with our podcast too. I mean, the theme for Under the Influence, I think is a really great theme that people always tell me in emails. I love it when I I hear the first notes of that. We always, in our other podcasts, it's always a, an original piece of music written for the show fully. We give the uh, composers full, a full brief on the show that they are to answer in the, in the music. It isn't just a great piece of music. It has to conceptually set the table. I'm going to just turn the lights on so the camera, and I've got one more question for you, and then we'll tap into my biggest mistake, and, and then we're going to go watch Let It Be, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah, so for those listening, they, they, you wouldn't know this, but uh, you haven't seen Let It Be, the movie? Since? since it came out, and I raced to the theater in Sudbury in 1970 to see it. The Beatles movie. And I'm sitting on a bootleg copy that I got in Bangkok. Can't wait. Many years ago. Okay, I'm just going to turn the lights on. Hang on. What is it about your voice? I don't even know how to answer that. And here's the strangest thing. I I never did voice work. I was the director. I was always on the other side of the glass. I never ventured into voice work. I never thought about it. When we pitched the show to CBC, I pitched it with a fellow radio writer named Mike Tennant. We pitched the show, CBC bought it, and then we had to figure out how to mount a national radio show. And I had assumed that Mike and I would do the show together, that it would be a two-hander. And then Mike said to me one day, I, I don't want to do it. It, it. I think you should do it. And I panicked. I said, I, I don't even know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to be the solo voice on this show because I've never done it before. And I'm not sure I'm the right guy. So Mike talked me into doing it. And that's how that came about. Like it wasn't a, a goal. It wasn't um, something I wanted to do. Are you aware of the tonality of your voice and your style? I'll put it this way. Perhaps you're not aware. I will tell you. I'm not asking. I'm telling you that the tonality of your voice and the style of your speaking is, it's intriguing. It's compelling. It it sucks me in every time. I imitate you often just for fun with my wife, Carolina. I'd like to hear that. Uh, Well, (laughs) a couple more beer. Okay. Uh, But Well, I'm not aware of it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what that thing is you're referring to. I don't know. I'm I'm completely unaware of it. It's you have a sense of pausing that I fell in love with. Take this as a compliment. It's similar, I think, in a way, to the pausing of William Shatner. <laughs> William Shatner, yes. Well, do you know the story of how he why he pauses like that? 
I think I did hear it. Tell but, me again what well, it is. He, he was a stand-in in, at Stratford, Shakespeare. Right. And he all of a sudden got the emergency call in at one point. He had to go in and take like the main role. Couldn't remember his lines. So he would then look over to the side and think, if I talk in short bursts like this, then I can remember <laughs> what my next line is. Right. Spock. You know, and... <laughs> And there were write-ups about this guy with this unique acting style. And he kept it. And you have that, that, you know, I hang and I wait for when you're under the influence. <laughs> it's this moment, because even when you say that, and you used to say the age of persuasion, right. uh, it's this moment, it's like, you bring it all home when you say that. Right. You tend to speak lyrically in a lyrical flow and you'll, you bring your thought bubble home each time. It might take a minute. It might take three minutes. Depends on where you're going with it. But you always bring it home. And it's like you're constantly telling, look, we're both storytellers. And, and what is not what is better in this life than telling a great story? To me, almost nothing. And I agree. That's what you're doing. You're constantly telling these stories. But you have 30 stories to tell in you know as many minutes. I often say that's the secret to our show. I mean... Think about it. Under the Influence is a show about advertising, a topic most people have no interest in, a topic most people think is irritating and annoying. Yet we have all these wonderful listeners. Our podcast was downloaded 7 million times in 2020. Why is that? Why, why would a show about advertising on a network that's advertising free, on a network people would run to to avoid advertising? Why is that? And I really, truly believe that the reason is that I tell stories. It's the storytelling that people are drawn to. And I'm not talking about my storytelling. I'm talking about the concept of storytelling. Because the interior structure of, of our show, Les, is I, I tell an opening story that sets the table that's not marketing related. And then I tell five stories that then that all, all hung, hang together on a theme. And then I try and pull the insights out of it in, as you said, when we get to the end of the show. My show is based on five stories. And I disagree with you. I'll hmm. tell you what I think it is as a listener. Okay. But before I do, and in the spirit of storytelling, this is one of my songs where I did venture lyrically to tell a romantic story of two people alone in the wilderness on the adventure of a lifetime. From my debut CD, this is Northern Wilds. I can take you with me But I can't take you home She'd never known such total passion The way he touched her fingers The way he let them go On the two travel To the northern wilds Past waterfalls Tumbling rapids Across the lakes in stillness Beneath the eagle's cry They wonder Nothing of this world Could stop them Could ever take away Dreams of yesterday They made love beneath the starlight Wrapped in northern lights The caribou could hear them whisper The wolf would keep them company Calling in the night even in the winter When most folks stay indoors They rode upon wood and rawhide Along the frozen highways The creeks and forest trails They wander 
nothing of this world could stop them, could ever take away these dreams of yesterday. Life was made for living And dreams were made to fly These two were meant for something better So they turned their backs on easy And into the northern wilds they wandered These two were meant for something better so they turn their backs on easy And into the northern wilds they wander Nothing of this world could stop them Could ever take away These dreams of yesterday You know what? Aggressor Adventures, while being the largest liveaboard dive operation in the world, is so much more. They have safaris and excursions to the corners of the globe, exciting opportunities to see vast archaeology, history, and natural wonders. I've been traveling and diving with them for years, and I cannot endorse them enough for being simply the best there is at making sure your worldwide adventure is a safe, comfortable, and exciting one. Take it from a guy who has done a lot of adventuring. Who do I travel with on my vacations? Aggressor Adventures. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. In my opinion, it's the research, which I feel is impeccable, and it's the sound of your voice. It's the X factor in your voice. And I know you're being humble, so I'll say it for you. I'm not being humble. I'm being I'm being truthful. I, I think I think the research feeds the stories. It gives me the still the need the voice. The stories. Still need the X factor of the voice. You still need that, and you have that. And that's before meeting you, before knowing you. A lot of other people could have told the same stories, but they don't tell it like you do. That's from having an Irish dad and a Newfie mom. That should explain everything. Yeah, that's when a it good- comes to weaving a tail it's a good combination right there i think as you know by the way i interviewed ronnie james an old friend of yours uh he is right here we we actually sat 30 feet down on the cement there it was a warmer warmer time and uh that was a i haven't presented i haven't given that over to uh, uh for those who are listening and don't know but but uh, i'm a i'm a member of the apostrophe podcast you are, network proudly, which is yes your company very proudly and for part of that i interviewed uh ronnie james he got emotional i had not seen I knew Ronnie enough to know that he was a man with a with a heart, a big heart, yeah. and he, he started speaking about a few things. And it, it, it took us a while to get through past a couple of moments, shall mm. I say? Yeah, really, really intriguing. And uh, and then I let him rant on about politics, which is great because <laughs> right. if he gets going on that, it's, it was just he's funny. a he's a wonderful guy. He and I did literally probably a hundred commercials together over the years. Wow. I bet. Yeah, he was just a funny energetic, fun to have in the studio, actor that could just save my bacon in a, in, when I got backed into a corner in a spot. He was one of those go-to guys for me. He always made me laugh. Why? Because his, his humor is intelligent. He, he comes across as the East Coast uh, scotch swilling, you know, whiskey swilling kind of newfie, but, but, it, but in fact, he's not. He's a highly intelligent man. Oh, for sure. His humor is incredibly intelligent. I, I agree. And cerebral. I, agree. I, th- I think most comedians are, are highly intelligent. I really think that's a big quotient in humor is that you have to have a, 
when I watch great comedians at work or great comedic actors, or even going back in time to how Cary Grant, I read a line that some, you know, some actors will squeeze a line to death and Cary Grant will tickle it to death. <laughs> and I thought, you know, cause he just had such a light touch, but he had a thing and he was a very intelligent guy and could see that by playing it small, it was funny, not by playing it big, but that's why I love Bob Newhart and guys that can just be so subtle with the humor and be so screamingly funny with it. That is the, I think the, the tightrope act let's go to your book because of that but i also have an off question that i want to ronnie ask james could have this. been in this book you know because didn't he wasn't his success where he went down to hollywood to try and make it didn't mm. make it came back and then created a whole show about not making it in hollywood it, and that exactly. was really the fuel and for the sake of everybody listening he's just released his first book right I, i've seen yeah. it on instagram yeah uh, forgive me ronnie i can't remember the name of it but i'll put it down in the description and and i haven't got a copy yet i, I intend to read it as i intend to read my biggest mistake my best mistake Oh, is that? So the books, oh, look at that, eh? I thought the book was my no, biggest no, mistake, no. but because you've erased, again, we have talked about this earlier, the cover is brilliant. It is a great cover. Very ingenious. And it's my best mistake. All yeah, right. not biggest anymore, right? The biggest led to the best, right? Okay, do tell. Do tell. Where does this come from? I've always been fascinated. If you listen to our radio show, you know that I am endlessly fascinated by creative solutions. And I'm equally as fascinated by people who have a catastrophic career moment where they lose their credibility, their revenue, their jobs, and it ends up being the best thing that ever happened to them. So I chased two kinds of mistakes in this book, one being the catastrophic career mistake, they ended up being the best thing that ever happened to somebody. And then alternatively, I, I chased small mistakes that seemed insignificant or tiny or that people didn't even realize they had made it was so tiny, but that ended up turning into a huge thing that became the best thing that ever happened to them. So that's what the core of the book is. I wanted the message of the book to be that if you find yourself in a huge disastrous decision you've made, that if you can muscle through the pain, that you'll get to a point where if you then peel the mistake like a banana that at the heart of the of the mistake is the solution at the heart of the mistake is the opportunity that will get you out of there that will you can have a lazarus like moment in your career because at the heart of that mistake is an opportunity the first chapter in the book is about the movie jaws everybody knows this well told story that Steven Spielberg is 28 years old. This is his first big movie he's given. He has all the bravado of a young director. He doesn't want to use miniature sharks in a tank in Hollywood. He insists on, on, on building three animatronic sharks, and he wants to shoot it in the ocean. One shark moves left to right, the other one moves right to left, and the other one is fully skinned for the full-on shots. He tests it out in, in tanks in Hollywood, it's all working great. They go to Martha's Vineyard. They start to shoot the film and all the sharks malfunction and stop working and sink to the bottom of the ocean. So think about the moment he's in. He's on location with his cast, with his crew, with three animatronic sharks and the shark doesn't work. So he's in his hotel room one night, panicking, thinks his career is over. The crew has started to call the movie Flaws instead of Jaws, quietly. Ouch. And he has this moment in his hotel room. And the moment his, he thinks to himself, what would Hitchcock do? And in that moment, he realizes that not showing the shark can be the best thing about his movie, that what we can't see is the scariest thing. And by the way, the mistake he made... This is the point of the chapter. The mistake he made was he had never tested the sharks in salt water. He tested them in freshwater tanks in Hollywood. The second they got into saline water, the salt corroded all the, the pneumatic hoses and all the electronics, and that's why they didn't work. Every great, if you will, great uh, survival story that you've ever heard started with a simple logistical error way back in the beginning interesting that's every single one is if you'd just done this you never would have ended up alone in the jungle right right and if he just took a day to test it in salt water would have been a whole other movie that's right he would he would not have had that the the three see he couldn't afford to build a shark that could work in saline 
because he'd already put so much of his, he only had $3.5 million budget, right? Yeah. So he decides to rewrite the script in the hotel room that night by not seeing the shark. So he decided that just showing a dorsal fin and a tail fin moving through the water would give you the sense of how big the shark was. Or that scene less where he drags those big yellow barrels and you could see how how powerful the shark was. Or, of course, saved in post-production with John Williams' amazing score. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. So when the shark got closer to to his prey, it got louder. And then when the shark was swimming away, it would, would get quieter. And we only, this is the amazing thing. We only see that shark in its full glory for four minutes in the movie. Yet, don't you think less that we have seen that shark in our minds for two hours? Exactly. So that whole movie was was built on the back of a mistake And Spielberg says, which is the last line of that chapter, that the malfunctioning shark added $175 million to the box office. (laughs) He played off of the imagination. He capitalized on the imagination of the human being, which means also that he didn't assume the masses needed pablum. He assumed they would be intelligent enough to have their own imagination. Right. And put that shark in there. Right. And that's brilliant. Give me an example of the smaller version. The Who. The Who is a band struggling in England because there's an explosion of bands in England in the mid-60s. They land a manager who's a very smart marketer, and he says to them, you have to find your thing. You have to find the thing that makes you stand out. He says, you can't be the black sheep because that those are the stones. You can't be the white sheep because those are the Beatles. They're the good guys. You have to be the red sheep. But you have to find your red sheep thing. So that stuck with the band. They thought, what, what, what is it? What, what, what is our thing? So they were performing around London in a, in a series of bars. They would just, you know, they would keep getting hired in this kind of, you know, four or five bars that they would rotate among. One of them was called, I think, the Railroad Tavern. They had played there many times. But that particular night... Unbeknownst to the band, the bar had rebuilt the stage because it was too rickety. And they built it about four inches higher than what it had been on all the other performances that The Who had played. So in the middle of their performance, Pete Townsend is doing his trademark windmill strum. He throws his guitar up and he pushes it right through the ceiling and snaps the neck right off the guitar. Because he's four inches higher than what he thought he was. He couldn't judge the ceiling height. There are a bunch of girls in the front row who start to giggle and snigger at what he had done. And he felt humiliated in the moment. So in order to salvage the moment, he pulled the guitar out of the ceiling and smashed it to pieces on the ground. As if to say, I meant to do that. Mm -hmm. Daltrey was furious because he thought we're making no money and now we have to buy Pete Townsend another guitar. The next performance, Keith Moon kicks over his drums and and completely kicks his drums to pieces. And then Townsend smashes his guitar to pieces. And then that became the thing that they just destroyed their instruments after every performance. That became the red sheep moment. That the music was good, but they also destroyed their instruments at the end of of their performance. All born of the mistake Townsend made when he jammed his guitar through the ceiling and snapped off the neck. And that became, as he says in the book, you may laugh at me for breaking all the guitars over the years, but that is what made you notice me. I still feel that like with this book, my best mistake and with your work, you you know, I try to promote the show uh, under the influence, for example. Yes. And I always go, so, uh, it's a show about how marketing affects your life. No, 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 no. You got to understand. It's really good. And, and, and I go into this instant, got to save what I just I said. Know, so I think, what's the, what's the elevator pitch for Under the Influence? And then follow that with, I want to know the elevator pitch for my best mistake. The elevator pitch for Under the Influence to me has always been, I'm going to give you a backstage pass to the closed world of advertising. That was always my pitch. Even to CBC, that was the pitch. That sounds more intriguing than what I say. Yeah. And... I think the pitch for this book would be, what is the surprising upside to screwing up royally? It sounds like the kind of book that a lot of people seeking to move ahead in their sets of circumstances uh, can get a lot out of. I think there's two kinds of people in the world, Les. There's people who screw up royally 
and panic and run. And they maybe would abandon their career or they want to recede into the ether. They just want to just run as far as they can from this horrible mistake. Then there's the other kind of people that I'm writing about in this book who don't run. They choose not to run. They muscle through it. They make a decision that's interesting and they find this incredible redemption in their careers. And I think that's the nugget is when you screw up royally, stop and ask yourself, what's the hidden gift? So that's really interesting because sometimes screwing up royally means you went down the wrong road. Right. And I've been a believer that on the odd occasion, yes, quitting or backing up is the right thing to do. But I feel that most of the time, look, I got far enough down this road and I hate it, but I'm going to commit to getting through to the other side and finishing it. And I have found that on the other end of that, even though I hated it, that part of it, that section of road, right at the end of the road, it paid off in ways I was not expecting. You got to get through the rough part of the road. You know, when pilots have this checklist that when something goes wrong in the plane, if there's a mechanical, something goes wrong mid-flight, there's a checklist that has been around forever that helps the pilot get through the crisis. And the first thing on that list is fly the plane. Hmm. And I think, and I talk about that in the last chapter of the book, that fly the plane is the first thing it says. And I think that's the message in this book is in the middle of catastrophe, when you've lost your job, you've lost your credibility, you've lost your revenue, you're humiliated, fly the plane. In other words, don't stop, don't give up, don't run, fly the plane. Because once you get by the turbulence or the rough part of the road, as you just said, you will find an opportunity in the middle of all that heartache that will be the next part of your career. Here's another example. Rob Lowe, I do a chapter on. One of the first sex tapes that destroyed his career. A sex tape got out of him with two girls. One of them was underage in Atlanta. It got out there. He was humiliated. The phone stopped ringing. Nobody wanted to work with Rob Lowe. It was just, he was like, uh, he was like um, radiation. Like nobody wanted to go near Pariah. Pariah. Just horrible. He started self-medicating a lot of drugs and, and alcohol And then he gets a call one day. Funny, the phone finally rings and it's Lorne Michaels. And Lorne Michaels says, we want you to host Saturday Night Live. And Rob Lowe instantly knows what that means. It means that Lorne Michaels wants to poke fun at him. That he wants to use him as a pinata on the show. His agent says, do not do this, Rob. This is too serious a thing that's happening to you. It's not funny. His management says, do not do it. His family says, do not do it. He does it. He, he hosts Saturday Night Live. They make fun of it from the opening monologue on. He meets Lauren Michaels. He meets Mike Myers. We see that he actually has a comedy bone in him because prior to that, he's Mr. Heartthrob, mm-hmm. right? They hire him for Wayne's World. And from that moment on, he has a burgeoning career in comedy. I mean, he's done West Wing and a couple other things. But if you look at the arc of his career, comedy saved him. And it would not have happened if he had not taken that hosting gig on Saturday Night Live. And he has said that this, not the scandal, but the fallout of the scandal was the best thing that ever happened to him because he cleaned up his act. He got straight. He wasn't drinking anymore. He wasn't doing drugs. He met a wonderful woman. He married. He had kids. And he had this comedic career that saved his life. So there was, out of the mistake of the sex tape, came, you know, at the heart of it was he took a chance on Saturday Night Live, and that opened up a world of comedy that he's still writing, Parks and Rec, name it, to this day. Not to be airy-fairy about it, but in terms, in, in, in a karmic kind of way, what he did was he owned the situation. He owned it. And that is... Fly the plane. Yes. That's always been vital. So just, just own up to it. Just go. Just own it. Don't, don't worry about this thing that everybody else is all... You know. And he really did own it. When you read that chapter, he owned it. Even when he was on... He would happen to be on a movie, a promotional tour of a movie called Bad Influence, where in the movie he videotapes 
mm-hmm. people in bed. I mean, it was almost like he was doing a research for that movie, but he wasn't. But all through the press tour, he literally said, I, I did something bad and I got to just live with it. And it was my choice. And like he, he owned it. Terry has a brand new book out, My Best Mistake. It is a brilliant take on the art of moving on from and making the most out of your biggest slash best mistake. And so ends part four of my chat with Terry O'Reilly. If you like this podcast, check out my interview with the legendary producer, Mike Klink, or the rest of this interview with Terry O'Reilly. When you're under the influence. No, 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 that's not quite right. You do it, Terry. When you're under the influence. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival, it's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, Can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Hey there! Oh! Go on! Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these forged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. The brand new special, Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. What the heck is going on? Oh! It felt apocalyptic. No radio, yeah. no TV. It happened almost instantly. No one was prepared for this. A lot of people just don't think it'll happen to me. It's basic human nature not to want to think about things that will scare us. If you wait until you need to be prepared for something, you're already too late. Anybody want to know what's like during a hurricane? And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google. For those and so much more that I produce during any given year, no matter what's happening on the world stage, we'll figure this life out together. Cue that rip and harmonica solo, Keith.